I really wanted just to say a few words. So, so, so my name is Mark French. I'm acting as the exec dean uh, currently. So firstly, to uh, everyone who's uh, from outside Kings, really w welcome, welcome uh, here. Um, and it's, uh, I think it's a really nice uh, opportunity for us to have good discussions with our uh, industrial collaborators or potential industrial co collaborators, particularly around KTPs. Um, and that's a really exciting thing uh, to do. Um, we've been sort of significantly, uh, I would say, investing energy into this um, enterprise uh, piece. And, and, whoops, ooh, crazy. Um, uh, with a team led by uh, Luca and, and Sarah. And so we're really, really keen to uh, be, become much more active in this space. And KTPs, I think, are the key um, sort of building block that it all, all comes from. Um, so I don't really want to say very much. I really want to hand over to Luca to sort of compare uh, the afternoon. Um, but welcome to everyone, um, and I um, hope you have a great afternoon. So over to you, Luca. <laughs> So, yeah, I've been told I should be using this mic because I walk around and then you will, uh, you will not necessarily hear what I'm going to say. So, first of all, welcome from me as well. Uh, my name is Luca Viganò. I am the Vice Dean for Enterprise and Engagement of our faculty, the Faculty of Natural, Mathematical and Engineering Sciences. It's a long name, but it goes to show the variety of things that we do in our faculty. Um, we do have quite a packed program, uh, which has already started a while ago with the welcome, and uh, actually even earlier than with the tour, and I, I, I saw that many of you went actually to see the labs and the robotics labs, and, and I will say a few words about that, but they're really uh, something that we are really proud of, and it's where we do not just our education, but also mainly our research, and that means also an opportunity to uh, to use them also for potential partnerships. Uh, I will now say a few words about Kings and, and why actually Kings is of interest for you. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you because I'm talking mainly to our external guests, but, uh, and, and you're most welcome to, uh, to actually ask questions also later about Kings and everything. We also have a Q&A. But I also see many of my colleagues here, which is, which is fantastic because the idea is really for this meeting to, to be an opportunity for us to get together, to mingle, uh, to talk with each other, and, and to ask questions that we might have. And indeed, that's why after my, my short introduction, we will have a talk about the KTP scheme. Uh, I'm sure that many of you will be familiar with that, but it's always good to hear from the source of knowledge, and, and Mark will be telling us more about that. And then we will also have two presentations by two of our current partners, Honeywell and Synoptics, who will tell us more about their experience, their business experience of the KTP scheme. And then we will have a Q&A panel where we will have the opportunity to also take a lot of questions from the audience. So if there is no time to ask questions uh, after the, the presentations, save them for the Q&A. Then we will have quick closing remarks and then the opportunity to network, to look at the posters again, to have a drink outside and to enjoy the space. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We don't have any fire alarm planned for today. So if the alarm rings, it's probably serious. Uh, but it's actually very, very easy to get out of here. We just go to the quad. It's a nice space. But let's hope we don't have to do that. Now. Let me tell you a bit more why Kings, and let me start by telling you who we are. And this is actually a very nice picture of the quad, namely that space outside, which if you haven't had the opportunity to see, I would very much invite you to go and have one of the drinks later in that space outside. You can also play chess or table tennis or just sit and relax. And and that is perhaps one of the best examples of the investments that King's has been making uh, in not just in our estates, but it also in general in our facilities, because many of our new labs are just below that space. And if you're curious about history, this is how it looked a while ago. And you can see it here. It was basically a car park. 
this is the main entrance of the kings on the strand. Actually, it's the entrance that is closed. And this is that space where the cars were parked. And now it's actually a free space for, for us to mingle, to, to sit, to, as I said, play chess or table tennis. And below the two floors, three floors actually below, that's where much of the action is happening. So let me, let me go back to the, uh, to the previous slide because this is how it looks now. Um, it doesn't have all the features on this, this picture yet, but uh, it is really such a fantastic place. We're really proud of it, and it is actually one of the main points of attractions for staff and students. Now, obviously, King's goes a long way. So in a few years, we will have our 200-year anniversary uh, in 2029. And from the inception, our faculty, so natural, mathematical, and engineering sciences have played a role in King's. Uh, from its very start, obviously, computer science didn't exist in, which is my own discipline, didn't exist in 1829. We had mathematics, which was the mother of computer science, engineering, physics, and chemistry. They've been playing a role at King's, and actually, it has been one of the places where we have had traditionally world-leading research uh, leading up to today. And what we have now is probably one of the most vibrant faculties of the university because there is the understanding that much of the research that we do, as well as the education, is relevant not just for our own disciplines, but also cross-cutting. And indeed, perhaps one of the things that King's is most famous for is multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. And due to the nature of our own research, Many of us, many of my colleagues, including myself, many of our professional services people, we work very, very closely with our colleagues throughout the university in a number of different applications of engineering, of mathematics, chemistry, physics, and informatics, which are the five departments of our faculty. Um, I think I will skip this, except for pointing again to the picture and saying, obviously, we have quite a big tradition of world-leading research. We have a number of Nobel Prize winners as well as winners, many of whom were in our faculty either as academics, as a, uh, either as students or as academics. Um, you might recognize some of the names, in particular Peter Higgs, famous for the Higgs boson, but also Rosalind Franklin, famous for the DNA picture, which was actually shot in one of the labs below the quad. Uh, and of course, James Clerk Maxwell for the radio waves, if they go to the eighth floor, not to the seventh floor of the King's Building, you will actually see uh, uh, information about that. But we are building on that legacy to do research that is contemporary, that is particularly relevant. You see some of the examples in the posters there and in the demos, uh, but perhaps what I want to highlight are the things in the last couple of bullet items, which I will tell you a few more things about in a moment, which really are examples of the kind of research that we are doing now. We have, we have, as I said in our faculty, five departments. So chemistry, engineering, informatics, which is computer science, mathematics, and physics. And in these departments, there is research that is happening around a number of very different topics. So for instance, in, in chemistry, it's mainly chemistry of life and chemical biotechnology and green chemistry. Sustainability is actually cross-cutting across the five departments and actually across kings. And I will say a few more words about that in the next slide. We have recently relaunched our department of engineering. I mean, engineering has been with King since 1829, but it has undergone a number of very radical transformations over the years, partly dictated by the fact that we are in the center of London. So I always make the example, you know, we don't really have room to have a labs that is working on airplane turbines because you would need a space like this, at, at the very least, to have an airplane turbine. Airplane turbine. But we recently relaunched our engineering around the program that we like to call 21st century engineering, namely engineering that is much more leaner, much more cutting edge, and focused around our strong tradition, for instance, around 
uh, robotics. You have seen the robotics labs around telecommunications, but also around a large number of other topics of engineering and engineering related to the other disciplines as well. For instance, we have a very tight collaboration with our colleagues in the Faculty of Life Sciences around biomedical engineering. Uh, we have informatics, so computer science, where perhaps one of the biggest strengths is AI. And indeed, you have come on a very interesting day today because today is the day we launch our AI festival, we'll go on for, which will go on for uh, four days. And it's just happening across the street in Bush House. And indeed, the timing is perfect because if you're free, program today will start at around 5.36. And it goes on also for the next few days. There are a number of different events. Everything is free, so you're most welcome to join us today or in the next days. Bring your kids, your family, your friends. Uh, there are a number of very, very interesting things happening which are showcasing our research, but also highlighting the opportunities for collaboration. We also work in cybersecurity, data science, and software systems, and indeed you see some of the posters there. We have a lot of research around mathematics, ranging from pure mathematics, including analysis, to number theory, so again, the strong connections with cybersecurity and privacy, with probability and applied mathematics, including, for instance, statistics and financial maths. So we have plenty of colleagues, for instance, who work uh, with uh, you know our colleagues in the city, but also I see, for instance, Tiziana here, who is one of the professors working on econophysics, complex systems in general, and many other opportunities in mathematics. And last but not least, physics. You see some of the demos there, so uh, quantum computing and lasers, levitating things. But here the strengths are around biological physics, nanotechnology in general, um, theoretical and experimental particle physics, so in particular cosmology and astrology and condensed matter. So quite a large number of topics, some of which might look theoretical, and indeed some of them are. But actually, if you dig a bit deeper, there are plenty of opportunities for this theoretical work to be done in collaboration with industry. And indeed, this is what is happening, as you can see in the demos and in the posters. So part of the idea around this event was to get to know each other a little bit better, to showcase what we're doing, but also, and, and I say this as vice dean and as part of the team who is trying to provide adequate support to actually encourage our colleagues to think a little bit more outside the box because we know from experience that collaboration with industry is a fantastic opportunity. And let me conclude by saying just a few words about some of our research centers. Uh, we recently launched as the Net Zero Center, which is a center that, as I was mentioning before, is looking at sustainability more broadly and net zero in particular, bringing together not just academia but industry. We have many industrial partners, policymakers, and the financial sector. We have a center for the physical science of life, again, a cross disciplinary center trying to understand the mechanisms underlying living systems. We have, and I saw Nick. Yeah, there. Uh, the director of the SERP Center for Urban Science and Progress, CASP, which is an interdisciplinary center looking at how data science can support the improvement of cities and, and urban science and, and, and progress in general. And you will have seen something also fairly recent for this area, namely that the strand has been pedestrianized between this building and the Bush House building. And we are very, very heavily involved in understanding first in planning that, but also in understanding how this is actually improving the quality of life, improving the quality of the city. We have also a number of research centers of excellence. So we have one of our strong suits is, safe and, is artificial intelligence, and we have a center of excellence around safe and trusted artificial intelligence, and Liz Black, uh, who is sitting there, is the uh, future director, or co-director, and a future director of the renewal of this center, and indeed they are uh, the, the people leading on the AI festival. We also have an AI institute, and we have the 
future director of the, there he is, Carmen Eventre of the AI Institute, again involved heavily in the AI Festival. We have a center for telecommunications research. We are an academic center of excellence in cybersecurity. We work with the London Center for Nanotechnology, the Crick Institute, and the Alan Turing Institute. But let me conclude very quickly with this slide, because this slide summarizes everything that I've been trying to say. We are, I believe, and if you pardon me saying so, we are very good at doing research, but we want to do more res impactful research. And in order to achieve that impact, and by the way, when I talk about impact, I'm not necessarily talking about revenue. I'm not necessarily talking about income. I'm talking about being able to make a difference, being able to ensure that the research that we do really means something for the outside world. And so we are very, very keen to boost our research and our innovation through collaborations, in particular around KTPs, and that's the topic of today, but in general around collaborations with Innovate UK. We also are very keen to engage in many different forms of collaboration, be they contract research, consultancy, industry fellowships, PhDs, and so on, CPD exploitation. Here you see some of our partners. And this is the idea of today, namely to get to know each other a bit better, to present what we're doing, but also to understand what are the opportunities for collaboration. Let me stop here because I've already run a little bit over, but I was keen to tell you quite a lot about our faculty. We are now going to um, hear from Mark Lynch, who I was trying to, to look uh, to, to, to find in the crowd, who is a knowledge uh, transfer advisor who is going to talk to us, tell us more about the KTP scheme. You are mic'd, so I will just... Does the, does the mic work? Mic. It should. Okay. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You very much. Superb. Thank you. Can you hear me, folks? Is that okay? Perfect. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks very much for the intro, Luca. And thank you very much indeed, folks, for having me. Um, my name is Mark Lynch. Uh, I'm an advisor from Innovate UK, but specifically for the Knowledge Transfer Partnership program, which I will detail now. Okay, so, <clears throat> quick show of hands. Apart from today, before today, who'd heard of KTP, one of those transfer partnerships? That's pretty impressive. I'll, I'll let our marketing team know. That's, that's, uh, that's quite good to hear. Right, okay, so, before I start talking about the program, this is really addressed to the businesses in the room. Now, these are tough times for businesses, I'm sure you guys don't need me to tell you that. Um, a range of challenges out there, which you'll all know about specifically. But at the same time, there are massive opportunities out there too. So if I highlight some of the things that are currently going on, some of these will resonate with you. So for example, you've all got to try and remain competitive. You've got to control your costs, really difficult at the moment with inflation, etc. cetera. Um, you've got to continue to innovate, generate, you know, produce great products, great services that customers absolutely love. Um, you want to increase those sales, and you really want to keep those fresh ideas um, alive within your business. Um, and those ideas eventually become your products and services. At the same time, you've been told you've got to, well, you ought to be boosting your productivity. Part of that, of course, is acquiring and retaining top talent, particularly difficult at the moment, um, and upskilling your existing staff. The world's changing massively, as we know, and we've got to ensure that your staff have got the skills that you require to power ahead and stay competitive. You've also got to think about automation and getting the right tools um, to ensure you are competitive and productive, as well as formulate better processes and procedures and use your resources better. Um, Luca mentioned sustainability. Sustainability is not just a hot topic. We know it's, it's crucial. Um, but the question I've got for businesses is, is you need to understand sustainability with regard to your context. What's going on in your sector? What are the trends? What's, what, what's the legislation? What's coming down the road? What are your competitors doing and what are your customers demanding? So putting together a, a meaningful, robust strategy around sustainability and what it then means for your products and services, your customer service, et cetera, your marketing, your advertising, all really important and fast moving. And we're talking about beyond greenwashing here. Consumers and customers are smart. Um, Companies are demanding it. If you want to get in their supply chain, you need to have tangible evidence. And last but not least, uh, on this far side here, digitization, massive at the moment. Mentioned, Luca mentioned AI, data, 
digital skills with regard to your staff, and important, importantly, just as important, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and well-being, both in terms of the moral but also the commercial imperative, why it makes a difference for your business, often linked back into acquiring and retaining the right skills. So there's lots going on in business. The good news is we've got KTPs in all of those areas across the UK, helping companies achieve great things in every, every area I've mentioned. Right, so what is a knowledge transfer partnership, KTP? Well, firstly, it's a flagship Innovate UK program. The program has been going for an awful long, year, awful long time. It's in its 47th year, so that's continual funding for 47 years, different administrations, different austerity drives, recessions, etc. It's been continually funded throughout that time. In that time, it's impacted over 14,000 businesses, and at the moment, across the length and breadth of the UK, there are about 760 plus live projects. KTPs are company driven. Yes, they're a collaboration between two partners, but ultimately, they're about high impact, commercially focused projects, which are really there to drive the strategic growth and direction of a business. So when we, as advisors, we talk to companies about KTP projects, the first thing we start talking about is what's your company strategy? What's your plan? And then we start talking about how the project will help you realize that and drive that forward. KTPs are collaborative by their very nature. So the way they work is this. A company will often have a plan, a strategy. They want to achieve X amount of growth or release a new product or, or something in the future. But often they don't know how. They haven't got the internal expertise. They haven't got the facilities. They haven't got all the knowledge. They may have some of it. And what we do is we partner them with a university, such as King's College, who has got the facilities, who has got the expertise, who are used to working with businesses, and ultimately know how to collaborate with businesses. As an advisor, I will then work with both partners, clearly scoping and carefully scoping and shaping that particular project, which is uniquely focused to delivering what the company wants, but drawing upon the skills, the expertise, and the facilities of the partner university. Working with the advisor, you will then put together an application, the good news is 79, 80% of our applications are successful. You receive a bunch of funding, and then you will jointly recruit what we call an associate. This is, I say bright young thing, the average age is actually 31, 32. But this individual will work embedded within the business, but be visited by at least two academics from the university, transferring that knowledge and expertise from the university via the associate into the business over the duration of the project, up to three years, such that by the end of it, the new innovation is business as usual. Delivery, well, projects can be from any sector within industry, so anywhere across the private sector, but also third sector too. Um, projects are often sector leading, highly innovative, hence the requirement for university expertise and high technology readiness level. So with regard to KTP projects, yes, we love research, but ultimately they've got to deliver against your bottom line. And about a third of the application is actually a, the business case. Understanding your market, understanding your competitors, understanding how this new innovation will provide you with a USP to then gain traction, gain sales, and ultimately profitability. So there's the model, folks. Um, we've got academia. On one side, we've got business, another side, and we've got the associate, the person, the link person embedded within the business, being the conduit for the transfer of that knowledge. KTPs are funded, Innovate UK being the principal funder, um, and resourced typically from the university. But apart from economic or commercial impact, again, as touched on by Luca, it's also about societal and environmental impact too. So what makes a great KTP project? Well, firstly, as I described previously, the projects need to be strategic. They need to be aligned to the company's growth path, the growth plan. Often that's in, that involves entering new markets or increasing your market share in existing markets. The four points beneath that happen to be the assessment points, the assessment criteria for the project. So we want projects which are innovative, sorry, which are impactful. So yes, financially impactful, I've mentioned the business case, 
We model what your profits will look like beyond the end of the project, out to five years. But also, when we talk about impact, we want something that's transformational for your business. This new capability will enable your business to pivot or change or dramatically improve. But that impact, as I said, is not only commercial, but often societal by its nature, as well as environmental. We want projects which are innovative. Um, innovation, you know, includes in the title of the, of the funder. We want projects which drive innovations which are new, novel, disruptive for the sector, certainly different from what you currently do at the moment. Yes, the projects need to be challenging. The story goes, if it's not challenging, why do you require public funds? Why do you require a collaborative partner uh, such as King's? Um, the project should be stretching and difficult, but at the same time realistic and achievable. And challenge, by the way, should be both for the company to develop and deploy, but also challenging the academics deployed on this too, um, as well as the associate who is there to deliver the project. And the final assessment criteria, or nature of a great project, is cohesive. In that application, we, we like storytelling. Start off with what the company's strategy is, what you're trying to achieve. And then what the project is, which will help you deliver that strategy. And then moving that forward, how you intend to commercialize that project, including routes to market, and then ultimately the profit you will make, but also the broader impact as well. Um, we, again, it's about compelling stories. It's about uh, us really convincing the assessors that this is highly likely to be successful, highly likely to deliver on the ground, highly likely to grow your business. We often talk about the golden thread, that storytelling. So, what are the benefits? So, KTP, because it's publicly funded, is uh, audited to death. It's currently just um, the draft audit's just out, actually. It continues to deliver. These figures are from the previous audit. So, these are for a typical SME who's taken part in the program. Okay, so the vast majority of them, um, firstly, it helped them accelerate or de risk their innovation. So some companies are spending money innovating. Some companies have got an R&D budget. What you really want to do is understand the likelihood of that R&D budget turning into commercial success. KTP de-risks de that by way of a proven uh, structure. Um, it increases your competitive advantage as a business. It moves you towards best in class by applying that cutting edge innovation. What we found for the average SME who took part Increase their revenue, but crucially their profit by over a million pounds, which is quite a lot of money if you're a small business. So this is over and above what they would have achieved from baseline if they hadn't have taken part. Um, most KTPs are around development of great new products, great new services, or radically improved processes. Often intellectual property comes out of it, sometimes for uniquely for the company, often shared between the company and the, and the university. And as I've mentioned, positive societal and environmental impacts are increasingly important in most of our projects, alongside that commercial imperative. What we found um, is com once companies have undertaken a KTP for the first time, they really like the idea of collaboration and the culture of innovation starts to blossom and they come back again either for other Innovate UK products or services or just to collaborate with universities or other companies. 86% come back appreciating what innovation and collaboration can do for them. Um, importantly, often companies make the link between R&D spend and profitability. So it leverages increased spend, not only for them, but also down their supply chain to the tune of over a quarter of a million pounds for an SME. And a nice spin-off for KTP is increased exports. Often, as they move towards best in class, we can partner with them with our Innovate UK Edge partners, and they start looking at exporting their products or services. Each product, sorry, each project you'll be supported by an advisor, such as myself or one of my colleagues, depending on where you're located in the UK. What's in it for the knowledge base or the university? Well, firstly, um, the majority of, in fact, all our projects tend to produce quite a few journal papers, conference papers, publications, and case studies, which often contribute towards REF and KEF. Um, it enriches teaching material. There's nothing better than teaching a theoretical subject and saying I was at X company last week and this is how they deployed it and this is what the impact was. It really brings those lectures to life. Um, it enables academics to 
deploy their expertise for real-world solutions, but also it's a source of valuable research income. Innovate UK will buy out the time of the academics and pay the institution. Um, but it also helps academic staff and researchers increase their commercial awareness in terms of what's going on out there in business and industry. And crucially, it helps to cultivate those strategic relationships between business and academia. For the associate, so the bright young person employed um, within, embedded within the business, it provides a unique springboard, helping them to apply their expertise that they've studied hard for or researched hard for to real world problems. And that's really important considering the, the existing skill shortage. Um, we mentor them. So they, in addition to technical skills, they receive leadership, management, project management skills, expertise, as well as interpersonal skills. So they're really rounded and highly employable at the end of the process. We provide competitive salary because, of course, we're in industries which are competing for the top talent. And um, in addition to CPD, I've mentioned mentoring. Um, they are mentored by myself if, if they were on one of my projects or one of my colleagues. But they're also mentored from an industrial person based in the business. So they get advice from two perspectives, particularly around the skills I've mentioned, but also the art of networking um, and building contacts within industry and academia. And 75% of our associates are offered a position by the host company. The others, by the way, um, tend to either start their own businesses, go into consultancy, join other companies, smaller companies, etc. So, a few stats about KTP. At the moment, um, you can see the number of projects we've currently got live. We've uh, plans to increase that to 1,000. We've got funding to increase that to 1,000 by next year. Um, the average age is 32, as I've mentioned. We've currently got 731 business partners. And there's a breakdown of the company sizes who take part. The majority are SMEs, but we have got some large firms. I've got projects of GSK, P, um, Tesco. Uh, within the scheme, we've got Unilever, Rolls-Royce, Jaguar Land Rover, lots of others. And on average, it costs 80 to 100,000 pounds per project. A chunk of that is Innovate UK. And the success rate for applications is 79%. So, eligibility, any industry, any sector. Private sector, as well as third sector. And there are a few, we've now started opening the scheme up to elements of the public sector, particular local authorities, the National Health Service. You can apply at any time. We have six competitions a year. As soon as one closes, another one opens. Funding, the way it's shared is a chunk of it is paid by the company, so you want some skin in the game. If you're an SME, it's a third of the cost. If you're a large business or a subsidiary of a large business, 50-50. Third sector, 25%. Costs vary depending on where you are geographically, the skill set, um, and the duration of the project. But on average, the company contribution per annum it's about 35K up to 75K. The majority are at the lower end. Okay, most projects last two years. You can stretch out to three years maximum. So if any of this resonates with you, if you have a fledgling idea, um, do contact your friendly uh, King's College London Industry Partnership team member or myself, and we'll be more than happy to talk to you. Um, and for me, that's it, folks. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I'm going to hand over now to John Rogers, who is the Senior Advanced R&G Engineer at Honeywell. Thank you, John. Just press that button there. Oh, you are, oh there's the slideshow. Marvellous. Brilliant. I'll start my stopwatch so I uh, get vaguely close to time because I'm afraid I could ramble on for ages. Okay, so... Pilot Physiological Monitoring System, cover slide, don't need to say a lot about that really. Um, introduction, so I'm the, I think you use the term industrial mentor, helper, whatever. We need an expert on physiology within our project, but I'll come to that in a moment. So my background, 40 years in the aerospace industry, life support systems, I started off as an apprentice, done a bit of flying, you know, worked in R&D, worked on cockpit, cockpit pressurization systems, um, then went outside, 
various other aircraft systems, flight data recorders, even crashed flight data recorders, so quite fun. Um, I've come back to Honeywell, um, advanced technology, small team, growing rapidly. We actually feed into various sectors within Honeywell, and there's a network globally of engineering fellows which we work through uh, supporting um, development, R&D basically. So it's the, it, but it's the advanced stuff, not the developed from the previous. Um, the pilot physiological monitoring system, it's principally aimed at fast jets, and we're actually tied in with the um, school of, uh, well, it's the institute, uh, the group of um, aviation medicine experts in, in one of your life science parts, I think is the right term, used. So, a little bit of history about the company. Seems a bit bizarre I'm talking about a biplane to begin with. So, Westland Aircraft, started in 1915, are, we're still on that airfield now. We're now owned by Honeywell, but it's basically the same bit. Well, not the same people, but generations of, you know what I mean. Started off building biplanes, the short 184, um, Sopworth, one and a half strutter, and moved on as the years moved on. So, sub 10,000 feet, your lungs are developed to cope with the environment you're in. I mean, take a breath now. You're comfortable breathing. You've got the right amount of oxygen, you've got the right lung capacity, you're fine. Sub 10,000 feet, that's pretty much what we evolved for. So moving on to 1933, this is a wonderful picture of um, our Westland Wallace, which was modified with one of our first life support systems. Simply an oxygen system, gaseous oxygen system. I won't dwell on that too long because I've got another close up from that. So, first float over Everest. 1933, wrecking Everest for climbing. Um, as I said, early life support system, that's not actually the first flight that's shown in the photo that's always shown as the first flight. Apparently the camera jammed because it was frozen. Um, temperature's a bit of a problem at that altitude as well. So, a bit of detail about the state-of-the-art life support system. So, actually quite a cunning flight suit, electrically heated, gloves, boots, Mask even, goggles, all electrically heated. Simple compressed gas system. I think it was a constant flow system, but I haven't been able to find total detail, and it's kind of irrelevant to the modern systems now anyway. Um, <laughs> as I said, electrically heated crew, breathing gas as well, and the camera, which didn't work quite the first time. So, now this is where I could ramble on. Um, so the current life support systems and the need for pilot physiological monitoring systems. So, first of all, the combat aircraft cockpit is not fully pressurized to sub 10,000 feet conditions. Largely to keep aircraft weight down. Also, because it's actually better for the pilot if he has to, has to bang out, because what happens is you get, just like divers, you actually get the bends if you actually get that rapid step change in pressure, then you actually can do some serious damage to yourself. So it's maintained at a reduced pressure. It's not fully pressurized. The oxygen system. So, as I mentioned, the size of your lungs, they're sized for now, for here, for ground. When you go up in altitude, I'm probably preaching to the converted here, but more spaces between the molecules. You need a finite number of molecules of oxygen in a breath to keep you happy. And the only way to resolve that in the early stages was to actually enrich the, the air the pilots breathe, breathed. So there is actually a practical limit to that, and that's at 35,000 feet. Your lungs still aren't big enough. Um, interesting fact, I think I've got time for it. We talk about oxygen generation systems they don't actually generate oxygen. They remove nitrogen from the air fed to the pilot. So it's an oxygen enriched system, not an oxygen generation. So above 35,000 feet, you actually need to increase the pressure. Now I'm talking about cockpit altitude here. There's a differential fixed between cockpit and ambient. As I said, I could ramble on for ages about all of that. Now, basically the only way to get enough air or oxygen into those breaths is to start compressing the pilot. And that is done, 
I'm about to point on the screen, which is fairly unhelpful. Basically, on the flight suit, the upper portion, he's actually got a waistcoat. You can probably make it out. It's actually inflatable. And what we do is we actually force a compressed gas into the waistcoat, crushes the chest in, and at the same time, we overpressurize the lungs. Now, we have some very delicate regulation system which actually controls the balance between the two pressures so we don't damage the pilot. Um, so that's pressure breathing with altitude. It's a pretty unpleasant sensation. Thing is, the cockpit of a modern combat aircraft is a pretty tough environment. So, G protection. This is, again, done with pneumatically inflated garment. So, you pull the nose up hard, blood tries to rush to the feet. Loss of blood pressure in the head, faint. It's bizarre to faint sitting down, but that's exactly what G-induced loss of consciousness is, G-lock as it's referred to in the industry. So, what happens is at the same time as the pilot pulls the nose up, there's a mass stack in the regulator system which actually demands pressure increase in the trousers. And there's inflatable bladder inside the trousers which gives the blood nowhere to go. It's not a case of crushing him, it's a case of just not letting that blood go downwards. Higher G levels, you then need more restriction and again we go to pressure breathing with G. Constrict the chest. Now, pilots are also trained to do G-straining maneuvers, which are learned um, during training. And they are tensing various muscles. Um, quite demanding, quite tiring, but necessary uh, to prevent them blacking out. Now, the human is the most fragile component in the aircraft. We can develop aircraft systems that will stand 23G. Easy. Pilot, not so good at that. But the demand for faster, more agile aircraft is pushing the envelope on pilots. So, what we want, and I'm going to go off slide a little bit here because I've got an extra two minutes by the look of it. Good. So what we want to do is actually start looking at what's going on in the pilot. We want to look for the earliest signs of any form of incapacitation, any form of problem. Now, if there's difficulty in breathing because he's done his seat belts up too tight in his harness. That reduces his lung capacity. That can produce real hypoxia at altitude, even though the life support system is delivering perfectly good on-spec gas. Of gas. It, it, the system's working right. The aircraft systems are working right. The pilot isn't. There's a number of other effects which we can see with difficulty of breathing, the effort of breathing, because you're breathing in here comfortably, easily. There's no restriction. When you've got a mask clamped to your face and you're placing a demand on a regulator to then switch the supply on and then you have to breathe out to actually switch the supply off to then be able to exhale, that bites into the time you're breathing in and out. So the result is, again, not quite enough oxygen. Now, at the, at the altitudes we're talking about, while chucking the aircraft around, he's already on the ragged edge. So, with monitoring the pilot, we can feed back. We can improve our life support systems because we have feedback. We can improve pilot training. Oh, the phone's going to turn off now. There we go. Um, so we can improve pilot training. For example, G-straining maneuvers, when they train for G-straining, they can actually improve their technique by being able to get the feedback to know what the effect is happening in real time. Hypoxia, apparently pleasantly like being a little bit drunk until you keel over. Oxygen starvation to the brain. Now, you don't get, like in the movies, the panting, because that reflex is actually triggered from carbon dioxide buildup, not from lack of oxygen. The movies, some of them anyway, have people panting away because they're at terribly high altitude. And there might be a little bit of that but the key driver is carbon dioxide buildup, and you're exhaling that perfectly comfortable, comfortably. So feedback to the pilot, the real-time feedback will improve their performance. Feedback to the life support system, that can either 
allow the life support system to correct an error, over enhance something. If we find that there is something that we can over enhance, we, you know, our, our established standards are pretty good, but there's potential to improve. Feedback to the aircraft system enable the aircraft to intervene. Now, we're talking beyond sixth generation fighters here. We're talking beyond the next generation fighters because our project is the early stages, but we'll come to that in a second. So where was I? Feedback. The life support system, enable intervention, autopilot, ground avoidance, be a good idea if they faint. Engage other recovery systems. I don't know quite what I'm talking about there, but there might be something. We have kicked around the idea of the occasional electric shock, but that's probably not quite what's going to happen in reality. And importantly, I think, record the pilot's state, physiological data to the black box, to the flight data recorder. Because at the moment, oh, well, the pilot was probably unconscious, or, oh, probably something happened. It's a major part of the aircraft, and we don't have that feedback. As I say, currently, we monitor the aircraft system and the life support system, not the pilot. And yet the pilot's the brains between where the plane's going and, well, oblivion. So, the knowledge transfer partnership, why it's important to us. So we developed our life support systems right back from 1915, 1933, you saw some steps forward. We got spun out of Westlands to be a company called Normal Air. The aim at that point was to pressurize the cabin to ground level. Normal air, clues in the name. So we worked with the RAF Institute of Aviation Medicine and KCL, in fact, one of the professors, the professor who wrote the book, Aviation Medicine, actually, back in the 50s and 60s, and uh, through the 70s, worked with us in the 80s and 90s. Uh, directly at our site. In fact, the guy on the right cycling is one of our development engineers, or possibly one of our design engineers, breathing off one of our systems. That's in inside an altitude chamber. He's probably at 25,000 feet in there, or the pressure equivalent of it. So we actually try it on our own people, or we did. We don't do that now, actually, for health and safety reasons, but we trialed our systems with the expertise from King's. That was critical. So, life support systems specifications developed over the years. We now follow those specifications and standards. But as performance increases, aircraft performance, the environment's becoming more demanding. We need to step up again with our systems and with our physiological monitoring. We will be able to do that. So, it's actually bringing Honeywell back in closer contact with Kings bringing an associate who will be, and I use the forward tense because we've, we've made the offer, but they haven't accepted yet, fingers crossed, um, will be coming to us as a physiology expert to actually be part of the life support systems and advanced tech group uh, to push this forwards. Huge potential to, for, to improve aviation safety, and it has spin-offs in the civil sector as well. And I think I've managed to finish with 30 seconds to spare. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we're now going to hear from another company. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Sam Farrow, who's a deputy tech director and head of tech at Synoptics. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I'm actually not Sam Farrow, to start off with. Uh, my name's Callum. I'm one of Synoptics' project engineers. Sam is also here today, though he is just nipped to the loo. Um, so you're very welcome to have conversations with him, but I'm afraid you're going to have to listen to me instead for a little bit. So the aims of this presentation, we were asked to talk a little bit about why we consider KTPs to be a vital investment in the R&D future of our company. So we're going to talk roughly through who synoptics are uh, and what we do, why we think KTs, KTPs are important. Um, we've got one kind of current KTP and one that is going to kick off very shortly. And then a couple of kind of conversation starter case studies. We want to have some really good conversations with you in the networking later on. So hopefully 
um, start a little bit of a conversation, give you a chance to get in and get engaged with us. So Synoptics is a systems engineering consultancy. We were established in 2011, and we work across a diverse range of industries. So uh, defense, rail, aerospace, proper space, um, energy, maritime, you, kind of, you name it, we've done, we've done it across, across the industry. You know, there's a couple of things that we've worked on up here, including the kind of A320 there, Bell 525 helicopter, uh, the astute submarines, and a Type 26. Um, we try to bring innovation into everything that we do. Quite a lot of these projects rely on a lot of historical legacy engineering that they've, you know, will do it the way that we've always done it. And what we try and do is go, actually, there is a better way. We can bring some of that cutting edge research in uh, and do things that haven't been done before. And we're also uh, heavily invested in R&D projects and that, some of that is within the KTP structure. So first of all, I want to talk through a couple of the kind of the challenges that both academia and industry have and then why the KTP is so good at bringing that together. These are generalizations, and they're not true in, in all settings, but in general, academia, academics tend to be quite specialized. There are fairly generalized academics, but by the nature of academia and kind of to be at the, the cutting edge of something, you naturally have to specialize. In general as well, I think academia does struggle with delivery. Getting products out of laboratories and into real life, get users using them, and actually getting them on the ground. Monetization is always a challenge. Um, you know, I've been in academia myself, and the funding cycles and the grant applications are a pressing concern. And, and also getting that information that you're generating out into the real world. So that isn't just about journal papers. Uh, it's great that we're getting better with journal papers. I read recently that 47% of research published in the UK is now open access which is fabulous, but it's also about things like sharing data so that other people can look at what you've done and use that uh, to develop their own work as well. Industry also has an awful lot of challenges as well, and I apologize for the formatting of this, it's gone slightly skew with. Um, in general, people in industry go the opposite way, so we need to be able to move across multiple projects, and that entails um, being a bit more of a generalist because you can't always hyper-focus into the same thing. Companies also tend to be a bit more risk-averse than academia because at the end of the day, if we don't make a profit we, and kind of break even and ideally make a profit, we won't survive as a company and therefore we do have to be more risk-averse in order to um, alleviate that risk. And I think the last point there is delivery prioritized above excellence. And again, this is a bit of a, a generalization. But if you go to a, a director who's making a decision on a project and say, we could include these six cutting edge tech ideas, let's do it, let's build something that's better than everyone else has done it, but there's a risk we're not gonna deliver it on time and meet our contract, they're gonna rein that back in because the risk to the company is significant. And for us, that is where the KTP comes in because we get that novel technology, those cutting edge technologies, academia gets funding and delivery experience, particularly uh, from a system engineering perspective, I call that right side of the V cycle experience, if you've got any experience with systems engineering. So that is things like integration, verification, validation, getting things ready for market, and that other, um, the other readiness levels. So technology readiness level is something that we obviously need to push up to get something into market, but we also need to think about system readiness levels, regulatory readiness levels, the integration readiness levels, everything that sits around a product to get it actually being used. A Couple of projects that we've got at the minute, this is the KTP that we've been working on with the University of Leicester and one of, uh, an academic who is now at, at KCL actually. This is uh, for a computer, computer vision system, uh, it's edge based and it's aiming to do automated census on railway crossings. At the minute, this is a very manual process. It's done by a, someone with a clipboard standing there and marking off how, they, how many people they see. What we've done is we've got a prototype installed on a rail, railway crossing in Cheltenham that is taking real data and it can take that continuously and it aims to detect how many vehicles and other 
crossing users more widely and make a count of those. The key thing that we've got from, uh, from academia is some of the algorithms that we're using. So we're using stochastic uh, algorithms for AI governance within this uh, on top of the kind of neural network that is classifying them. And we've also got a KTP that's kicking off fairly imminently, I don't know the exact date, um, with the University of Bristol looking at uh, cybersecurity monitoring in uh, critical infrastructure. So we're very interested in that. And also how we can take a step beyond the actual project itself and look at, for example, what's the next generation of cyber warfare look like? What might cyber attacks look like in the future that haven't already? And these sorts of projects give us the avenue to look into that. Uh, again, this slide has gone a little bit skew whiff, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but generally the benefits is it helps us to diversify, expand our reach. We get promotional opportunities of all different kinds, including STEM engagement opportunities. We're developing a version of this that we can take to careers fairs to try and get young people engaged in, in, in research. And it allows us to collaborate and get that experience into our company. We d there are problems with it as well. It's not a perfect solution. Nothing is a perfect solution. Um, and there's a couple of things here that if you're thinking about KTPs to be aware of, um, the, the associate does have to publish, which if you don't manage it carefully can impact on your delivery timescales. It's easy to overestimate how you can get done, how much you can get done, and how long it's going to take. So you've got to be careful on that. And you do have to be aware as well that the kind of people that we want as these associates are incredibly high demand, high skill associates, and so there are some problems sometimes with, with the remuneration that you can get. Kings, we're really excited to be here today. I really enjoyed the robotics tour. It was absolutely fabulous to see some of the research that you guys are doing, and I'm really looking forward to see if we can have some more conversations with all of you about that. Um, Particularly, I know you talked about impact earlier on. It was really good to hear that prioritized because it's not just about engineering in a vacuum. At the end of the day, the, the things that we do have an impact on real people's lives, and we've always got to be conscious of that. Now, I'm aware that I'm probably running on with time a little bit, so I'll whiz through these last case studies because uh, please don't feel you have to take it all in because we've got them on the stand as well, and I'd love to have further conversations about them with you. This is an example of a kind of problem about healthcare. Uh, so it's, we, healthcare has a lot of data that could be created within it. So things like uh, imaging, things like Internet of Things enabled medical tests, that produces an immense amount of multimodal data. And if you don't manage that and the data that you're creating very carefully, you're going to really struggle to actually deliver uh, problems with that. And when we've spoken to kind of industry within, within the healthcare industry, they say people talk about it, but we don't get it through to the bedside. And at the end of the day, again, it comes back to that impact. So here's an example of just how we can use some logical architecture to make sure we understand the complexities of what our technology has to deliver. And also, again, another quite busy slide, but this example of a digital twin of a uh, critical infrastructure, in this case, an energy system. And it, creating that key two-way data flow. So we're taking things from the physical to the digital, but then we're also bringing it back into the physical, and we're moving up that information value chain. We're not staying down at data management and sense making. We're breaking through into decision making. And there's significant challenges with this, because uh, a lot of ethical issues and how much we trust AI, and that's where we're really excited to work with some experts. Uh, to bring that innovation into, into, our, into our business. So yeah, that's everything from me. Just a kind of final slide there on things we're interested in, but broadly, it's pretty much everything. Um, and we're particularly interested in interactions between these things. So if you're looking at taking a new technology and applying it in a new industry or a new application, those intersections are, are, are really where we're at. But yeah, unless there's... Anything else? That's all from me. Brilliant. Thanks, Callum. Um, so, okay, well, so, I'm just going to um, hand over now to our Q&A panel. Um, for all the speakers, can you come back up onto the stage? 
Um, and I'd like to hand over the chairing to my colleague, Yanis Samis, who is the Industry Partnerships Program Manager. Hi, everyone. I believe we might need the, an extra chair. We've got everybody there, so we've got uh, John actually. Is John with us? John is there. Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Right. Thank you all very much for being here. It's been marvelous listening to your presentation. So I'm very happy that our industry partners uh, basically um, uh, they responded to our invitation. They, they managed to be here today. And uh, what we'll do now for the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will pose a few questions to our panelists, and then we will also take questions for, from the floor. I believe we've got about, until three o'clock actually, before we kick off with our networking session. So I've got a question that I'd like to address to, to Luca Vigano, our um, uh, Vice Dean for Enterprise and Engagement. Luca, um, how do KTPs um, actually fit with our faculty's impact agenda, and more generally with, with um, the college's agenda? So um, KTPs fit really well, which is the reason why we're, we're having this event today, or one of the reasons why we're having this event today. So um, what we noticed, and, and, and perhaps I should preface the fact by, by, by saying that our faculty has recently made a huge investment in providing support for industry engagement. So when I started being vice dean, it was basically a team consisting of two people, so myself and, and a professional services person. Now we have a team that is about 12 people, depending on how you count them, and some people are shared. And, and this really means that we are trying to provide a full-fledged support for industry engagement, ranging from enterprise, and you have seen Sarah and Yanis, who are two examples of the people taking care of that, there are others in the room, uh, to engagement in general, which doesn't necessarily mean industry engagement, but it means engagement with external partners, to comms, and you have seen many of the comms people around, so making this event happen. And the reason why we did this is that we noticed, as a faculty, but also as kings, that we are quite good at industry collaborations. So many of us, many academics, have a lot of industrial collaborations, a lot of industrial partners. We do research, we publish papers with, with our industrial colleagues, which is great. But we are not there where we would like to be in terms of systematizing these collaborations. And this might mean to, of course, better income, but as I was saying before, it mainly means a, a more solid impact. And that is the reason why we are keen to foster KTPs and other collaborations with Innovate UK. Because we want to make it this as part of our day-to-day -day business, rather than leaving it to the initiative of, let's say, the individual academics and the individual companies. That is why we have that support in our faculty, but also at King's level, to really make sure that we bring our collaborations to the next level that we really try, really capitalize on what is already happening around research, but make a difference for the outside world, make a difference for the companies. I mean, what I really liked of these examples is that we have seen that through the collaboration with academia, there has been a huge benefit for the company that probably would not have happened in that way or in that time frame had the collaboration with academia not taken place. Uh, shut up here, I would love to talk more, but I'm no, conscious of time. Thank you very much, Luca. Impact is a huge subject yeah. indeed. Um, I'm sure uh, everybody's got their own ideas about, about impact. Um, um, I'd like to uh, come to you now, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have indeed many companies who are, have approached us in the faculty, and, and me in particular, uh, to engage with us and to initiate conversations about a research partnership and they often come asking about KTPs, actually wanting to know more about KTPs. And these companies um, are a range of companies in terms of size. So I just wanted to ask you for the sake of our audience, please, is there a particular stage in a company's traje trajectory in terms of, of growth that hits the sweet spot for, uh, for them being a, a, the optimal candidate for a KTP? 
Okay, so thanks very much. It's a good, good question and an, an often asked question. So we talk about eligibility. So who's eligible and who's not? So um, <clears throat> there's a few things we tend to look, look for. So you might recall in my slide deck, uh, I think it was the penultimate slide, where I mentioned um, the contribution from the company. So we like companies to have some skin in the game. Uh, the projects last two to three years on average. Um, we like to think the company's going to be there for the duration. Um, and what we tend to find is that if a company contributes money, um, they've got a better vested interest and they're more likely to deliver. But also, you've got to remember that the Innovate UK contribution is public funds and you all pay taxes. So what we really want is companies who are going to stay around to the end. So we tend to look at the company's ability to afford to pay that contribution as part of our due diligence check at the start. So all companies who take part, we look at um, any records at company's house, particularly uh, previously submitted uh, accounts. If it's an early stage business, so perhaps they haven't yet submitted or they've only submitted one year's accounts, we look at other factors which demonstrate their ability to pay that one third contribution if it's an SME or 25% if it's a, if it's a third sector organization. So for example, if a company is in, the easiest criteria, if a company's profitable, you're virtually in. If you're not yet profitable, but perhaps have raised investment, we'll have a look at what, the, what that investment looks and feels like. And ultimately what we want is a warm, fuzzy feeling that you can pay your contribution towards the scheme as well as continue to afford to run your business. But ultimately it's on a case by case basis. In terms of company size, so affordability is one thing. In terms of company size, in our experience, and bearing in mind, as I say, the scheme's been going for 47 years, so there's a fair bit of, there's a few case studies out there. Um, companies where you've got, I would say, maybe three or four people, that's probably about the minimum size, full-time equivalent staff I'm talking here. And there's a number of reasons for that, folks. So the whole purpose here is about knowledge transfer, so transferring expertise into the business. You need people to transfer that too. And in our experience, if a company has got two people, one person, they may have nice titles, CEO, CTO, etc. But the reality is if you're at that stage, you're running around doing everything. Everybody, most people here knows how, how the startup culture goes. And so the efficiency and also the effectiveness of firstly managing the associate, who is the person transferring the skills, but also transferring knowledge into the business such that it becomes business as usual is decreased. So we like to, I mean, most of the projects I've, I've dealt with, the, the minimum number I've seen is probably about four full-time equivalent staff. And we, we, we talk about full-time equivalent staff because of course companies use contractors and consultants. There's no guarantee they're gonna be around for the duration of the project. So we want to have people who are gonna be there for the duration of the project. We need to have a company who can afford their contributions but ultimately we need, a, we need to have a company who ultimately want to grow and scale. So we often talk about KTP as a scale-up scheme as opposed to a start-up scheme. Um, but if you're at the lower end, ultimately it is about a case-by-case -case review which the advisor will help you with. Perfect, uh, that was a very thorough answer and uh, I'm sure we'll have a chance to, to, uh, to ask you more about that as discussions progress. Um, uh, now I'd like to come to, to you, John. Um, thank you very much for your interesting presentation about the old pictures of, of um, um, pilots uh, in their gear back in the 30s and all that. Um, so I understand you have a long-standing relationship with Kings, uh, with um, the professor who helped you uh, decades yep. ago to, to set up uh, your, your R&D program, basically, and who wrote the book, actually, on, on, on the topic, right, if I understood correctly. So I'd like to understand um, you, you're now just kicking off uh, KTP with us, uh, even though it's not with this faculty, it's with uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Center for Physiological uh, Human Research. Um, why is a partnership with King's at this moment in time valuable to you, uh, to Honeywell, and what is it about this KTP in particular that makes it uh, important to your R&D program at this point in time? Well, in part, it's marketplace need, it's, it's aircraft advances which are going to be more demanding, it's also um, improving systems that we deliver. Now for us, Kings have unique 
expertise in aviation medicine. They work with the RAF Center of Aviation Medicine, and we need basically to work with that sort of capability and expertise. Now, the associate is going to be an individual, and I use the forward tense because they're not appointed yet, um, who has both physiological knowledge but also some degree of engineering knowledge or potentially will develop uh, engineering knowledge. So it's, it's that opportunity to actually get that communication with the subject matter experts. And King's actually get something out of it as well. In fact, the um, head of aviation medicine, Pete Hodkinson, I don't know whether you know him, he, um, he and uh, his, his colleague Ross actually said that uh, when, not if, but when we get an operational system, then they'll be one of our first customers because they'll actually be able to push their research as well. The other thing, which I will just explain quickly, is that a life support system, you take your pilot, you, know, you, you judge people by what looks normal in the doctor's surgery or the hospital. We have parameters where it's, oh, that's a heart attack, that's a this, that's a that. When you're pulling 6G, <laughs> inverted, at 37,000 feet, the responses may look very, very different. So what is actually healthy and normal under those conditions, we're also going to have to determine. And that is such medically biased, non-engineering work. So it, it really is a collaborative effort with King's. Thank you. Can I just press you on one point? Um, if you take the pilot out of, of the system completely, <laughs> as, as you alluded to towards the end of your talk, because we're moving towards you know very fast jets and, and technology is pushing the limits there. Is there, I mean, I'm just thinking, it just came to my mind now that in this faculty we have active research in autonomous systems, uh, drones and whatnot, so. Um, well, there. Is, is Honeywell somehow active in moved, that space at all? When I moved away from life support systems to, to other things, I thought drones were five minutes away. And they weren't. And they're still not, realistically. Um, fully autonomous drones, which can actually make those snap decisions, it's very hard to find a substitute with a pilot. But we also have the spin-off into the civil aviation industry. And also, don't forget that, um, for example, tanker pilots refueling system, part, you know, another side of my work, um, you know, long haul, relatively boring, straight level flight kind of scenarios. Physiological feedback is again, and pilot state monitoring is again um, Important. useful. And also, um, you know, that could spin off into the safeguarding the civil aviation sector as well. I mean, I think co-pilots would like to know when their pilot is having a heart attack, for example earlier rather than later. <laughs> Sorry to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very interesting space there. Um, I've got a question for, for uh, Sam now, who's with us. Um, and I was thinking in particular about the AI revolution that we seem to be in the grips of at the moment, um, because it's all over the news. Um, do, do you think, as Synoptics, do you think that uh, companies in the UK are adequately prepared, basically, to, to position themselves in this space? Um, and uh, I've got a second, uh, a second um, branch to, to my question. Um, what are the opportunities, challenges, and risks that a company such as yourselves uh, faces um, when, you, when you're uh, confronted with this AI revolution? And how can partnerships with, with universities uh, help? So I'll try and do this all in one hit. <laughs> so it's a big question. It's a good question. It's a big question. Um, so I'll constrain my answer by noting that my entire career I've largely spent in the government sector, whether that's working for government agencies uh, or for engineering entities that are developing large complex uh, projects, engineering projects on behalf of government. Now, if you in that context, if you look at what, what actually makes a company well situated, if you look at it from the context of a customer, you want a customer that understands the benefits of the particular technology you're talking about and is willing and capable of integrating it into their operations, into their processes, into their organizations. At a company level, you want the intellectual horsepower to be able to understand the technology to the degree that you can identify the barriers and the challenges to its development. 
You also want a business and engineering ecosystem, which is the tools, the methodologies, the frameworks, the skill sets in order to realize that technology into a product. And then the next level below, you've got the science and technology base that needs to be invested and focused on fixing the fundamental problems which will stop that technology being realized into a product. If you're in that position as a company, you're in a good place. If you look at that in the context of AI, we have a customer community, particularly from a government perspective, thrilled to death about artificial intelligence. But once you get below strategy and a policy layer, they aren't particularly well informed or, let's say, capable of defining the benefits that it can bring to them. And they don't quite understand the implications in terms of the integration of AI tech into their organizations and what that means and also the opportunities it brings. So the demand signal going into the companies is, is, is a little mixed, it's a little muddy and it's not consistent. At the company level, I think there isn't enough skilled engineers with knowledge of AI sitting in a lot of these companies. But I think also we fundamentally, a lot of our processes and frameworks aren't able to support the development and the pull through of AI into a lot of these products. Whether that's the regulatory aspects that Callum touched on, you know, a lot of our security and, and, and safety frameworks are implicitly built on the fact that you know exactly what's going on inside that system and you can interrogate it and you can logically follow through the decisions that have been made. AI is a new paradigm for that. When it comes to VMV, VMV AI systems, it's very, very different to how we do VMV on other systems. And then down at the sort of the technology and science based is, is it as focused as you would like? Um, on the key challenges associated with AI and realizing in products. It's, not as, it's never going to be as focused as we like, but no, it isn't. And I think all of that, whilst I'm painting a pretty grim picture there, I think all the pieces are there, the enthusiasm, the funding is there. But I think we need to recognize the difference, and I like the word you use, revolution, in terms of evolution. In evolution, when you're talking about those three different levels, the, the customer, the, the, the industry, and the companies, and then the science and technology base, we implicitly know what each other is interested in. We've done this before, we just need to do it better. So industry kind of knows where the customer's heading. Academia and the science base kind of knows what the demand signal is going to be from industry. So we can work semi-independently. As soon as you talk something as revolutionary as AI, that implicit knowledge goes, goes out the window. And you need to work in a far more integrated, top to bottom manner. That's certainly where Synoptics are positioning themselves in terms of the work that we do. And fundamentally, that's where I see the KTP as a key enabler. It at least does the bottom half of that stack in terms of industry and, uh, uh, and academia. Um, if we can fix the top half of the stack, which is different ways of doing that, we've got that necessary integrated top to bottom working, which allows us to do it. So I think all the pieces are there, but there's work to be done. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to hear that you touched upon uh, VMV validation and verification, right? In, in, the, in the AI process and also safety, um, ethics as well, and we've got teams in, in Kings that uh, actually tackle actively these, uh, um, these challenges and are, are actually looking to train the next generation of experts through their PhD programs. And I'm thinking now about uh, Liz Black and her, and her um, program, her Center for Docal Training uh, that is coming to an end now, but will be renewed, hopefully, to, 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 um, to hire new students from 2024 uh, to work in this space. Um, and we're looking forward to partner with industry uh, in, that, in that area. Um, we're very eager and keen to do so. Um, you, in your presentation, in, in Callum's presentation, there was a, a, um, a slide there about cybersecurity. I'm just thinking that you've got Luca next to you, who's also very active in, in this space with cybersecurity. So if you have some time, I'd like to, and we do have some time actually, I'd like to hear a bit more about how you approach safety and cybersecurity. In, in your uh, R&D program? It's so that particular KTP, we're still in well, similar position to, uh, to John, we're just in the process of, uh, of hiring the associate at the moment. Um, essentially what that's looking at though is looking at the, the use of AI agents to try and enhance, it's more sort of actually on the cyber resilience side as opposed to the uh, cyber security uh, in terms of the detection, the classification and the recovery from cyber attack. One thing we're finding with a great deal of our clients at the moment, and you could argue, particularly in defense, they're always slightly behind the curve, is that the focus for the last 10, 20 years has very much been on the security, is bulletproofing your system. Um, now it's very much pivoting to cyber resilience, and I think a key part of that, and this is where we'll get the same challenges that I sort of mentioned before in terms of VMV and the systems engineering, is a parallel track, which is, again, how security was done in the good old days, is you design your system, 
just before it went into service, you did an analysis, find all the vulnerabilities you've got and desperately try and fix them. Um, now there's this secure by design principle uh, and resilience by design principle. Um, so I think, as I said, there's, a, there's the application of AI agents, but then there's a broader piece of how do you do that in a systems fashion, incorporating and verifying and validating the performance of an AI where appropriate. Thank you. We'll uh, certainly watch this space. Um, I believe I've run out of questions, so I'd like to invite any questions from the audience. Yes, if you can just just speak up a little bit, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from one of the online attendees. Uh, Rangini was wondering if alumni from other countries are able to apply for the associate positions. I believe this is a question for Mark. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good question. Um, absolutely. Uh, I can't remember the specific percentage, but around about two thirds of our associates actually come from overseas, um, which probably speaks to the chronic skill shortage in tech, engineering and science in the UK. Um, I think on an annual basis, we publish a, a map which shows the countries of the world um, colored in different colors um, and where our associates, ex existing associates come from, and it's, it's virtually everywhere. So yeah, absolutely. Um, what I will say though, from a company perspective, bearing in mind associates are jointly recruited by the university and the company, depending on the nature of the company's business, um, elements such as security, et cetera, those may go into the job specification. Um, but yeah, we, we're certainly open to, to associates coming from overseas. Thank you, Mark. Got a question here. Hello, uh, two questions for Mark. You mentioned that 75% of associates get offered jobs. Excuse me, could you please introduce yourself just very briefly? I'm sorry, I'm Nick Dillon from Selectsicate in Cambridge. Um, do you know how many take up those offers? It's about 64%. Okay, that's good. About 64, it's quite high. Um, what we tend to find is, firstly, associates actually love the work they do. But you might recall in my slide, I spoke about the mentorship. Um, and some of that is really about immersing themselves in the company culture and the, in the industry culture as well. And bearing in mind, the subject area is the associate's passion. Often these guys have researched in this area for a long, long time. So they really, really enjoy working for that business. So the vast majority of them do accept the position at the business. Um, but you know, they're, they're people and we've all got ambitions. Some have always wanted to start their own business. Some have always wanted to go and work for a large business within that particular sector, blue chip, for example. And likewise, some of them want to work for smaller companies or startups, but at a senior position post project. Um, but yeah, the majority tend to, to stay with the host company. Okay, thank you. My second question was, um, what's the typical interval between making an application for KTP and it actually starting? In terms of time duration? Yes. Okay, so this is one of those questions where it always depends on how committed the application team are. So I've seen applications come together uh, in the course of a few weeks, um, which is exceptional, it's rare. And I've also seen applications kick around, if I'm honest, for up to nine months. So what we tend to do as advisors um, is we assemble the team, we have what we call a scoping meeting, so that's the academics, uh, somebody from the host business, sorry, host university from the business development team and the academics, and we'll set out what's required for the application and time scales. Uh, when we set out uh, when we expect to see the first draft, which is probably about three weeks or a month or so. Um, but, it, you know, people are busy. Um, and it all comes down to priorities. We, we make it very clear when the next uh, submission date is and the one after that. Uh, and we typically aim for the, the nearest one. So if I had to answer your question, on average, I'd probably say it's a couple of months, maybe two months. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, it's uh, Michelle from latestcell.com. Um, I was very interested to hear the panel talk about um, collaboration, systemization, making a difference to the out world, outside world, etc. And my question is, it seems that the lack of R&D funding is related to education, and I think that's one of the key problems 
in terms of trying to get industry or the right companies to engage with um, sort of technology and understand it and therefore be open to using it. Now, one of the things that has also been highlighted with the panel today is that um, there is a focus on um, having companies that have a minimum of four staff members, um, that having someone who is a freelancer or, or a consultant is not as valuable as an employee because they may not stay for a full three years. But, I mean, I've been in technology for over 20 years, and I can tell you that the, the best um, engineers, the best coders, even those who are employed elsewhere, they're always looking for some hot project somewhere <laughs> as a freelancer, and uh, especially with AI. Um, the best have sort of set up their own businesses. They're happy to enter into either joint ventures or sign NDAs, or they can just be sort of professional consultants, but it seems that you're almost cutting off that angle, and it's a starting point, which perhaps is not ideal to have in a very established company with 10 or more employees, but in terms of the current landscape for tech, uh, especially AI, um, that's my, my knowledge of, of engineers and, and coders who want to engage, and they will engage, especially when they feel that the project is right, and the company is right, but the environment for that particular company doesn't seem to be um, one that perhaps some schemes will be suitable for, it seems. I'll, I'll take this. So the first thing I'll say is that it's not one's more valuable than another. This is one scheme. You might remember in Luca's slide deck, there is a myriad of different ways organizations of all sizes can cooperate and collaborate, certainly with academia, but also within each other, with each other. So KTP, remember, is one scheme of a myriad that Innovate UK offer. We have a number of competitions and calls which are absolutely applicable for one-man bands, freelancers, and all the rest of it. Um, this is one scheme. The point is, all of this is public money. Public money needs to be targeted at different areas and different companies, or you end up duplicating where that money is targeted. So whereas we're focusing on KTP today, and I've set out some of the criteria for this particular scheme, for other schemes, whether they're Innovate UK or uh, other public funders, or indeed directly from university schemes, there'll be something there for everybody. So it's really a case of doing a little bit of research. Thank you, Carl. Can we? The mic's right. Well. Can you hear me? My name is Nicoletta Brucoli. I'm from Sarah Zenon Partners. Uh, when uh, a company submits an application and has a strategy, has a project for which requires an associate, what happens if uh, these projects, uh, I, I've been involved in many of these, um, they are described on the paper, but then once you start working on it, they get in other directions. How flexible then is the project? How, how, how does it work in, in reality? In practice. That's a good question. So the scheme is quite flexible. So as part of the application process, there are essentially two main documents. One is the application document, which has got the majority of the things I've spoken about today. The other one is something we call a work plan, and the chaps will be familiar with this. So it's a stage-by-stage -stage project management document, which pretty much identifies how the project will be uh, executed, and it's the plan by which the associate follows. Once you receive the funding, we have governance meetings once every four months, and the very nature of applied R&D, and you guys will know this, it may take you in slightly different directions. So as long as the project team, so the academics, the company representatives, and the associate agree, there is flexibility to change direction according to that plan, providing it's in agreement with everybody. So it is quite a flexible scheme. And the reality is there are a few KTP projects that will run, for example, three years and be exactly like that work plan, because applied R&D as you know, may take you in different directions. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have another question here in the front from Silsica. Hello. Yeah, Fred Whiffin, also from Selexica in Cambridge. Um, Mark, you alluded to the different ways companies could engage with academia. And I think for small companies looking to engage, they're not sure always which, what way is best. And I don't know if all of you may have a view on this, but um, how would a KTP compare in particular to a sponsoring a PhD 
and where would a KTP be better and, and where might, might a PhD be better? So I, I'd, I'd, I mean, all of them have got their place, by the way. And sometimes we have KTP projects in companies who've also got sponsored PhDs. But I think KTP, as our, my colleagues have described, I think they're mo more comprehensive, more coherent, more far-reaching, almost certainly more commercially orientated and applied. Um, whereas sponsoring the PhD is absolutely fine if you want to crack a particular problem or investigate a particular area. But it depends what your business needs. It depends what your business wants. If your strategy is really around commercialization and getting the idea out there and ultimately uh, you know, generating profit, I think KTP is probably better aligned for you. Um, so it very much depends. And that's part of, by the way, when we start, when, when a project is, first comes across an, assessor, an advisor's desk, we'll have a look to see what's best for you. And sometimes I talk to companies and KTP is not the, not the right answer. Sometimes it is around you know, contracted research or it is around spons you know, a, a sponsoring a PhD. And our role is not to wave the flag for my particular scheme, it's to see what does the business require and then potentially put them in contact with the most appropriate solution. Yeah. Luca. If, if I may add something, uh, exactly what Mark said, but there is also an opportunity to talk to the academic partners. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the work that, that I am and, and, and the team and the NE team do. Namely, once you have the contact with the, with the academic and you have the, the project idea, let me put it this way, uh, we are there and, and obviously many of our <coughs> competitor universities too, uh, they have teams that do that. Uh, you know, we, we, we can provide the support to try and understand what is the best framework for that kind of research. I mean, we have people in this room who have gone through that process. They thought that the idea initially was suitable for, K, for a KTP, and then we understood, no, actually it was something else, something bigger, something smaller, or maybe more suited for a PhD student. There are, there are many different ways in which uh, you know, a project idea can be framed. So in a sense, you have this additional support that teams like ours can provide, and obviously there is then the contract point. Having myself gone, because I'm in the process of writing a KTP proposal, and we had our meeting with Mark last week, and it was tremendously helpful because I went into the meeting with my academic hat on, not not my vice dean hat on, and I learned a lot of things. I learned how to phrase the proposal in a way that it is suitable for a KTP, and, and what the benefit of actually doing a KTP is for the research idea, because that is something that you need to make explicit in the application, and it's something that will guide your work over the next two years. So it's not just a matter of, you know, of winning it, but actually, you know, do you really want to frame it as the research that you will be doing in the next two, three years in that way? Is that what you want to do? Is another Innovate UK project or an EPSRC project or something else perhaps the best, the best way to actually do that research? So having those conversations with the support that Innovate UK provides, with the support that we and others provide, that, that can really help. Both, and the academic too, by the way. So not just the company, but I learned a lot in the process. Fred, I look forward to speaking with you about this um, yeah. in our networking session as well. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, I think we've come to an end. Um, before uh, closing, I'd like to thank, first of all, our speakers and the companies, our partners, and our future partners who have responded to, to my calls and my team's calls to, to be here with us today, as well as Mark Lynch. And I'd like to point out for the people in the audience that we also have another person from Innovate UK KTN with us, and this is Richard Foggy there. He is also very knowledgeable about everything that has to do with Innovate UK and the various schemes, so please uh, uh, speak with him um, in the hour that we have at our disposal. So I also would like to thank uh, my, my colleagues, uh, Sarah, Ayo, um, Carl, Lizzie, um, Emily and Luca for his leadership uh, for helping us to put together this event. And uh, yes, I believe we have some, um, we have drinks and, and canapes and networking. And also the demos and the posters are there for, uh, for everybody to, to, to look at and ponder about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.